Welcome back guys. Um, today we're going to take a look at probably one of the first uh, major Holy Grail additions to my collection I picked up a couple years ago. This is an uh, LF&C uh, 1918 uh, Mark I trench knife. The uh, history behind these guys is pretty interesting, but before we get into that, just a few little specs on it. Um, this is obviously World War I. Um, this has a 6.75 inch uh, double-edged dagger style blade on it. And um, the blades on these, they were blued and they had a black oxide finish on it. And the uh, it's a bronze cast handle that was uh, chemically blackened as well. You have a steel spiked nut on here that the the blade essentially tapers down goes through has threads on it the nut threads on keeps the blade in place and nice and tight um, a lot of people call that a skull crusher pommel because of that spike shape on it and then obviously in addition to that and the with the brass handle being knuckles here they also cast these spikes onto each piece of the knuckle so Definitely a, a nice trench knife. This was, um, just to give you an idea of, I would uh, not want to get punched by that. That would that would suck a lot. Um, so, a little bit of history about this guy is that um, basically there there's two main manufacturers out there, uh, LF and C being one of them. But um, the this was an improvement of the triangular bladed um, and wooden handled 1917 trench knife. I don't have one of those in my collection to show you the difference, but that is definitely probably one of my next uh, goal items slash things I'm going to work on picking up is to have the 1917 trench knife as well. But that had a, a triangular blade instead of a dagger style blade, so it was really only good for sticking. Um, this is supposed to be good for slashing and stabbing, but, I mean, this is so dull. And these tips were kind of notorious for breaking anyway. Um, you're not really going to cut much with this, and this is definitely not like a good utility knife like a K-bar or something like that. But that was its intended purpose, was to stab and slash. And then, obviously, uh, so someone couldn't grab it, it had spikes, and also you could punch with it and, you know, come on down with it as well. But, um, so, uh... The first version of the Mark Ones was made by a French manufacturer called Owl Lion, um, and that was specifically done to speed up the production to get them to the troops to the front line faster. Um, the U.S. government put in orders for like one million uh, two hundred something thousand Mark One knives through like three to four different U.S. manufacturers to be distributed in October of 1918. Well, obviously the war ending in November of 1918 kind of caused that to not happen, and the ordinance canceled all orders of the Mark I except for one run of uh, about, I think, 120,000, roughly, uh, LF and C knives. So, so about 120,000 of these got produced, and um, the ones that did actually make it to the front lines were the French Owl Lion ones, so you will rarely see pictures of soldiers with them or you hear stories about that and you know or you see ones that said you know battle used veteran used whatever they're, they're all going to be the outlying ones uh, from my understanding and again could be wrong not an expert no none of the lfncs actually made it to the front lines now despite that uh, cancellation um, there have been several authentic Mark I knives found with uh, other maker marks on them besides outlying and lfnc um, those are exceedingly rare and sometimes faked, but there are some authentic ones out there that have come up uh, in people's collections. Um, but the majority of the knives that were made were uh, never issued, and they sat in army storage until World War II, where they distributed in very small quantities to like special elite units like Army Rangers, Airborne, and in some cases Marine Raiders uh, were seen with some of them. But uh, most examples of those Mark I's used during World War II were all modified to be more comfortable to carry and to fit in a uh, like regular style sheath. So, uh, like all the ones I've seen, as you can see how big that guard is, a lot of them would cut the guard down on both sides so it could fit in a regular sheath and then fit on your belt. Um, 
the sheath that came with this is a reproduction, um, so I don't have it with my collection. Uh, man, trying to track down an original sheath sometimes can be almost as expensive as at least what I spent on this knife a couple years ago. Now these knives are astronomically expensive, as is, like I said before in one of my other videos, almost everything is astronomically expensive now. But, I mean, these knives... I picked up this one for a, de a very decent price, even without the sheath. Um, and now they're like, I see some going for like 15, 18, 1900. It's just crazy. But like this one, you can obviously tell is never issued. It's still got some of that black oxide on the blade and definitely like a little bit of that chemical blackening on this. It's, it's definitely a little bit darker. So you can tell this was never, never issued and taken very well. Uh, very good care of this one. The tip is a little deformed on it, but it's not too bad. It's not really bent or anything like that. But um, so yeah, like I said, this was a uh, this is one I've wanted since I was a kid, and I could just never justify it. But uh, I happened to find one, uh, like I said, probably about three years ago, right about when I moved down uh, Tennessee. I found one online for. Just a very good price that I couldn't pass up. An opportunity arose where I could afford it at the time. And so I made it happen. Um, I, I do definitely want one of those 1917 trench knives to add to that. Um, you know, eventually when I get my displays a little bit worked out, this will go with that uh, Springfield Armory 1911 on a belt. And then the 1917 would go with the 1917 revolver on a belt. Um, so eventually I'll get that accomplished and put that together and you'll probably see it at some point so that's pretty much about it for this knife um so thank thank you again for tuning in uh for those of you who've actually watched these or give a crap um give me any feedback if uh, if you like these or if there's something you'd want me to change or if there's something that uh, you disagree with or just any feedback good or bad just let me know and um yeah i appreciate you tuning in and until next time be good